I'd like to call this meeting uh, to order. Mary Jo, can you call the roll? Carl Politsky? Here. Ron Van Kirk? Here. Meg Ryan Shockey? Here. Andy Selvertz? Here. Kathy Pucci? Here. Mary Bell Beard? Here. Kevin Tansky? Here. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Following the Pledge of Allegiance, we will uh, honor a moment of silence for the passing of Mr. John Bundy. He was a long-term representative of the Parma Hospital Board and also a former uh, Brooklyn firefighter and paramedic. I pledge We have a guest speaker, so at this time I'll turn it over to the mayor to introduce him. Thank you. Um, I will present Marty McGann. He is a representative from Greater Cleveland Partnership. Marty's going to discuss uh, the tax study that they just are working on or complete, yeah. continue to work on. So. Yep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of council, for the opportunity to say a few words today. My name is Marty McGann. I'm uh, Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Strategic Initiatives at the Greater Cleveland Partnership. The Greater Cleveland Partnership, just to spend a minute there, is the regional chamber of commerce in our region. We're the largest chamber of commerce in the country with about 12,000 members. We do an assortment of activities. Uh, my responsibility is to oversee our advocacy group. We do federal, state, and local advocacy. We do a lot of work with our businesses and other companies in our region on growing and expanding in our region. We do a lot of work on diversity and inclusion initiatives and helping organizations diversify their staff, their leadership, and their purchasing. And we do a lot of work around uh, education and workforce. We also uh, have a real estate investment arm where we, GCP, and our business community invest in, in projects around our community. But I'm here to talk to you today briefly about a tax study that our organization just completed earlier this year. It was a result of our strategic plan, uh, which we culminated uh, or, or we approved in December of 2017, where our business community said, among other items in the in the uh, in the strategic plan, that we have a lot of taxes uh, in front of us as a region, and we have a lot of big signature tax levies that our community is is commonly supporting, and we GCP, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, have funded a lot of those. We've uh, helped support and fund. Uh, issues around uh, the Cleveland schools in the city of Cleveland. We've helped with the arts levies in, the, in years past and health and human services. And on the surface, any one of those is good and have merit and are deserving in our community. But collectively, are we starting to cause additional problems in our community because we're not as competitive as we would like to be? So our business community uh, and a number of our members met with uh, a number of firms. We ended up hiring uh, EY, who performed a financial analysis with us over the course of the last six or so months um, and we released some of this information earlier this year but but it confirmed some of our some of our fears is that our region is is taxed higher than many of our peer many of our peer regions when you look at Indianapolis Pittsburgh Columbus uh, uh, Cincinnati uh, Buffalo etc we're taxed at just about uh, the highest you can be uh, when you compare to any of those other regions we're about 40% higher than our peer set from local taxes, and we're about 7% low in the state taxes that are paid by businesses and by individuals uh, across our area. So we went through in this tax study and looked at a number of different comparisons on that information. It's available on our website, and I'm happy to share it with uh, with the mayor and council members uh, and happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. But uh, from our perspective, it really turned into a conversation not about how do we reduce taxes, but how do we kind of bend that line over time? We've had a substantial increase over the last uh, seven to ten years in the taxes in our community, and I think we just want to ensure that as we go forward, we're starting to bend that line to ensure that we're competitive and, and can provide uh, an, an environment for economic growth uh, in our region. Uh, as a result of our tax study, and just to, to end here, uh, we had a lot of conversations among our members on, so what? What do we do now? You, we have this data. Um, and we have uh, an analysis that shows we're higher than most. 
for our business members, that became kind of the burning platform for looking at some systemic change in our region. So there's been discussions over, uh, you know, why do we have two airport systems? Why do we have, um, why do we have so many library systems? Are there economies or efficiencies that uh, that we should be building in as we look at taxes and the burden that that uh, both uh, individuals and businesses pay going forward? Ought there be different ways that we can encourage suburban collaboration or change government in a way that uh, can better serve uh, the public? So. We're starting that conversation now. We don't have any preconceived notions. Some of this has been reported in the press uh, over the course of the last couple of months, but um, we're just embarking on sort of our, our next phase of work now. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any or provide uh, some additional information and follow up. Yeah, first of all, thank you for coming. I appreciate that. When you said that, uh, run that number of me again, we're 40% higher than we're just about 40% higher than our peer set, um, and we looked at a number of different cities, Indianapolis, Nashville, St. Louis, Detroit, Kansas City, Milwaukee, uh, I think I said Cincinnati twice, but I'm not wearing my glasses, so um, Cleveland, uh, or uh, Buffalo, etc. cetera. Uh, about nine or 10 cities in our peer set, and that was taking into account all of the taxes that are paid, so that's uh, city taxes, that's school taxes, that is, uh, you know, the, the personal income tax or property taxes that are paid, uh, property tax for libraries, for health and human services, for uh, a, a variety of different services, even some specialized taxes um, like the syntax for our professional sports facilities or uh, sort of unique ones like parking that don't exist in some other uh, cities but exist in the city of Cleveland. So it's the aggregate tax burden broken down by the amount of population that you have. In a region, was there a certain area that stuck out more than others? As far as you know, you listed off a whole series of taxes there, um, and, and if I need to read through the website, that's perfectly fine. But this fascinates me that we're that much higher than peer cities. I mean, that's obviously a problem. Yeah, the the, the ones that really jump off the page are uh, property taxes and personal income taxes uh, are the ones that we are considerably higher on. Uh, on property taxes, we're about 25% uh, higher. On personal income taxes, we're about 250. Uh, percent higher than our peer cities but that takes into account and, and we always have to kind of caution I mean this was across state lines that fund things differently than we do occasionally I mean some of the pushback that we've had on this on this study is uh, this doesn't take into account sort of the historical uh, changes in, in revenue sharing that have happened over the course of the last 10 years or so and every community funds things a little bit differently uh, other states fund their transit at higher levels but don't fund it at the local level we fund ours exceptionally well at the local level with nearly 200 million dollars annually in sales tax but we don't fund it a ton at the state level so it, there's some anomalies built into that that we need to be cautious of but we are high on the property tax and personal income tax side so so in your study did you make recommendations as to how what Cleveland should do about that or, or not, not to that point uh, we didn't make recommendations in the study itself. EY just did a raw analysis. Uh, the, the recommendations that have emerged since are that we need to be thinking of some structural government reform changes as a result of that work. Uh, we haven't identified exactly what that is. There's a kind of a standard menu of, of options and we'll be embarking on some additional study with uh, partners in the community to explore some of those, but we don't have any recommendations now other than we kind of need to change this dialogue because that data was based on 2016 data, which didn't actually take into account some increases that we faced more recently with uh, Tri-C that was on the ballot in 2017, um, and then the Cleveland Public Library was on the ballot, as was uh, Cleveland Personal Income Tax, but that obviously doesn't necessarily impact your city, but there's a lot of other variables that have been changing and accelerating that growth even in the last few years. All right, one more question, other questions. I know, for example, Indianapolis has done this, as has Columbus. The regionalization has become a huge part of those cities. Um, is that kind of an area where you're seeing how these other, maybe these other cities are able to do it for less? Well, uh, to be frank, um, we've spent some time in those cities. So that is something that is on the menu of consideration by our members. We've spent some time in Indianapolis, Nashville, St. Louis, and Louisville. Um, and Louisville is the ex most recent example that has seen success in, in terms of uh, consolidation between different government forms. We are exploring those, um, but that's a marathon. This is a long discussion. It takes years to even begin that. St. Louis was embarking on a pretty, uh, pretty uh, sizable change in their government uh, uh, reform. They were uh, conducting some work to more merge their city and county government. They were five years into their plan. They'd spent um, a, a lot of money doing research. 
uh, and it fell apart over the course of a weekend. So these, um, there are challenges in going that direction. It takes a long time. What we wanted to do is start to change the dialogue around this, and it shouldn't just be a natural, hey, you're the next one up for a countywide tax levy. It's your turn to go get additional resources. That's really problematic in the long term, and it's a trend line that we can't maintain. Right, and could you give us that website where that, that information is located? Sure, um, I, I'll follow up with you via email and can shoot it to you, but it's uh, www.gc, as in Greater Cleveland, and then the word partnership.com. And if you click down to the advocacy section, um, you'll see the report in there, but I'd be happy to, to share it and can disseminate it out. That's fine, right. Any other questions, Council? Yeah, we recognize. Um, you mentioned the large disparity in the local income tax, and did you find that that disparity was so great because most of those other areas had already regionalized their governments, so the services were be, being provided on a regional level rather than at the local level? Um, and we didn't start this discussion from uh, examination of regionalism. Had we, we probably would have asked a different set of questions. Uh, we came at it from a we need to be more thoughtful on our taxes, and it ended in more of a regionalism discussion. Um, so it doesn't, um, so the data in the back end kind of shows that some of those are less expensive. Indianapolis is less expensive than us. Nashville is less expensive than us, and they have a more streamlined uh, government uh, per se than we do with the, uh, with the, um, the county, 59 municipalities, et cetera. But, uh, but we didn't start from that equation, so we've got a couple of data points, but not a full built-out argument on that issue. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? I just wanted to thank you. Um, Marty came to speak to the Mayor's Association about six months ago. He got an earful from the mayors. Um, but I, I think this is an important conversation to have, whether you agree on all of the stats or not, or the formula, I think it needs to be a dialogue. That's why I asked him to come here and present to city council uh, so they can know what's going on in the region. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, and we're just one part of the equation. I mean, this is, this is a community dialogue that we need to have across a lot of different areas and industries. If it's a Chamber of Commerce-led initiative, it's gonna be limited. So we very much appreciate the opportunity to come and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Sure, absolutely. What is your plan moving forward, or what is what are your next steps? That's a great question, and it's something that we talk about with our members uh, every uh, often. We we actually have a board meeting later this week where we where we will be discussing this uh, item again. So our next steps are we are going to continue evaluating individual agencies as they come to us. Uh, Tri C has a levy that will be on the ballot this fall. There's been some discussion over whether there will be a health and human service levy. Uh, in the spring. Um, so we are going to continue evaluating those on a one-by-one -one basis. I think this tax study gives a higher a higher kind of hurdle for folks to jump over. Um, and we've supported nearly all the tax increases that have come before us before. So uh, this is, a, this is we're changing our behavior while we're asking others to change theirs. So we are engaging in analysis of individual agencies while we're also starting the discussion on on sort of system change reform. We will be embarking on um, an additional examination. I'm not sure if it'll be with EY or not. I'm not sure if they're the best, uh, if they're the best consultant for that work. But we'll be issuing an RFP at some point later this year, or early next year, to continue a next phase of work that may look more at some of these government efficiency ideas. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marty. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, we'll have the public session. If anyone in the audience is in the safe for the good and well for the city of Brooklyn, please step forward, state your name and address, including city, and you'll be recognized. Please remember to keep your comments to five minutes or fewer. Stop of 4190 Ivywood Drive, Brooklyn, Ohio. Why are we as residents and elected officials allowing our once proud city to deteriorate? We have numerous city ordinances that shouldn't allow this to happen, but since no one seems to enforce them, it's business as usual. Years back when my wife and I moved into the city, the residents for the most part took pride in their property, but now for only a select few, none do. We used to have a mayor who would regularly drive around the city 
and if he saw something he felt wasn't up to standard, he would stop and go up to the homeowner and occupant or occupant and tell them about it and to fix it. He didn't need a lot of fancy ordinances to get this done. Whenever I bring up some issues to the building department or the service department, I'm being told that they don't have the manpower to enforce various ordinances. Are we that poor of a city that we can't hire some healthy part-time senior citizens to walk the neighborhoods and write down issues that they've observed and report them to the various departments? Just one of many issues are waste receptacle containers being brought out only after a certain time and being brought back by a certain time. And also, they're not supposed to be visible from the street. None of this seems to be enforced. I could give you an entire list of issues that could go, that go on unenforced, but I'm afraid it would only fall on deaf ears. Our recycling program, for the most part, is a joke and a bad one at that. Anyone can drive up and down the streets and see the items in the recycling containers sticking out in plain view that aren't to be recycled. But it seems that the driver picking up them can't see that. a clarification. My understanding was that the 2019-38 bill will be discussed after this session. Is that the time at which I would speak to it? It's up to you. You can speak now. Yes, there is a committee meeting at that time as well. It's up to you. We're going to discuss that bill in the committee meeting. It's up to you when you want to speak. You can speak now or you can speak then. You can speak at both. It's completely up to you. When you want to <laughs> I'll speak then. Thank okay, you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. John Wagner, 4825 Bentwood Drive in Brooklyn, Ohio, and my grandson. Aren't you going up again? Yes, I'm going up again. Good news. Um, we had a tremendous response this week for our own little Brooklyn area on the applications to the census. So thank you all who helped. Um, makes me feel good. We're in pretty good shape. We can always get more, so please keep discussing with your friends and neighbors, and if you have anybody that you think that I can network with to get more people involved, please call me. You all know how to find me. Um, I appreciate that. Off a side note, it's not Brooklyn, but in the area around the zoo is so underserved right now with applicants. We are way behind there. Again, I know it's not Brooklyn. I know it's Cleveland. But maybe some of you go to church or have a social organization or know people that I can go and speak to. You're probably tired of me speaking here, so you'd probably rather have me go speak there. So if you have any of that information, please pass it on to me. Uh, we just need to continue this push. And the other good news is we're about 100 days until the first of the year. And that's when this last big push to hire people begins. So a lot of people have been waiting for that call. They're starting to trickle in, and they will definitely, at the first of the year, be calling lots and lots of people for jobs. So again, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, John. You're welcome to call speak anytime. You're not bothered. <laughs> thank you, John. Anyone else? Okay. At this time, we'll now move on with reports of committees, commissions, and boards. We'll begin this evening with our Recreation Board, Councilman Tansky. Thank you. Brooklyn Recreation Centers fall into fitness promotion runs from September 22nd through September 28th. Buy a yearly pass, get two months free, or buy a monthly pass and get two weeks free. Online registration for youth basketball runs through October 31st at www.activityreg.com. Residents $40 grades 1 to 2. Residents $70 grades 3 to 6. You must show a current Brooklyn Recreation ID card. 
Grades one and two in-house Friday night basketball, clinical leave, all games and practices will be held at Brooklyn City Schools. Practices and games be begin in January 2020. Volunteer coaches will manage these teams with assistance from Brooklyn Recreation staff. Parents will be contacted in December by their coach. Grades three to four, grades five to six, West Suburban Recreational Travel League for boys and girls. This league will travel for games to suburbs such as Middlebrook Heights, Fairview Park, North Olmstead, Berea, Valley View, Brook Park, Olmstead Falls. Practices begin in November, games begin in December. Volunteer coaches manage teams. All leagues for grades three to six will practice once during the week and games will be on Saturdays during the season. Parents will be contacted by their coach in November. For more information, contact the rec center at 216-351-5334. The next recreation board meeting will be held on October 21st in the rec center meeting room at 7 p.m. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chancey. Uh, the Finance Committee met this evening at 6.30 prior to our council meeting to discuss the following. Uh, resolution 2019-4, accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them with the County Fiscal Officer. Uh, this is in regards to our inside property tax millage. It did not change. The amount did not change from last year to this year. However, the breakdown did change a bit. Uh, for this year, it'll be 1.10 mills will go to the general fund. 1.0 will go to the uh, bond retirement fund. 1.83 will go to the police pension fund, 1.30 to the fire pension fund, and then 0.67 to the street lighting fund for a total of 5.9 uh, millage. Again, this is the same as last year. We did have two notifications uh, that came in, the first of which was a grant award from the Cuyahoga County 2019 Healthy Urban Tree Canopy Program. And that's for $41,535, uh, and that is to plant trees at various areas um, around the city. 250 trees will be purchased. It will be planted this fall in the upcoming spring of 2020. That will be split about 125 each for the fall in the spring. The second of which was a notification uh, from the Laurel Garden Club. Uh, they are donating $1,000 towards the purchase of an irrigation system that will supply water uh, to the Blue and Gold Star Memorials as well as the Wooden Stars here in uh, Veterans Memorial Park. This is the area located right, up, right up behind City Hall. And uh, the Laurel Garden Club has been around for a long time and have had an active part in beautifying this city. And so uh, they are putting up $1,000 towards that's about a $5,300 project. So they're doing $1,000 and that will um, help water the flowers and get rid of the hoses that are currently running across there. Uh, then we had resolution 2019-5, requesting the county fiscal officer to advance taxes from the proceeds of the 2019 tax levies pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code. This is a housekeeping item uh, to request the county to advance uh, the Brooklyn uh, 2019 tax monies. Uh, ordinance 2019-36 is on second reading. This is accepting funds from Meridian Senior Living LLC or Brooklyn Point for sponsorship of the City of Brooklyn Senior Services bus. Uh, this authorizes a three-year sponsorship with Brooklyn Point in the City of Brooklyn for Brooklyn Point to advertise on the van while ensuring that the van is still identified as the Senior Services van. And again, that sponsorship amount is $10,000. Uh, ordinance 2019-39 is the only new item uh, for finance this evening and this is on first reading and hope to pass by suspension of the rules this is amending section 2 of ordinance 2018-25 uh, titled establish petty cash funds for various departments of the city of brooklyn and this updates an old ordinance 2018-25 and adjusts the cash amount in the senior center cash till from 60 to 200 dollars and this is change this change is due to an internal cash collection policy that the uh, finance department is in the process of finalizing and also to ensure the senior center um, has changed for the various activities at the center. Uh, lastly, just as kind of a follow-up question that um, Councilman Pucci had in relation to the city receiving the um, Auditor State Award. Uh, that was announced at our last council meeting. Um, the administration did some inquiry about when the last time the city uh, received that award based upon the Auditor State as well as the Brooklyn documents. The last time we received that was in that fiscal year 2012, a financial reporting. So again, I want to thank Mr. Raguse and his finance team for, um, for their job well done and congratulations on your award. Uh, the finance committee meets every uh, council meeting prior to it at 6.30 p.m. in the conference room. All are welcome to attend. At this time, we'll walk, move on to the Domestic Abuse Commission. Councilman Ryan. Thank you. The Domestic Abuse Commission will be having a table at Fall Fest this weekend. As with Picnic in the Park, we will have free pinwheels for the kids and relevant, relevant information about the commission and resources available around Greater Cleveland. 
Even if you personally are not affected by domestic abuse, it is very possible that a friend or a relative is, which is why our work is so important. Our next meeting will be held at the Brooklyn Panera on October 16th at 6 o'clock. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Next up is the legislative update, Councilman Woman Belbeer. Thank you. I wanted to comment on a problem that is becoming more and more prevalent in our society. That is the health considerations involving e-cigarettes and vaping. Governor DeWine announced this past week that his staff is researching his authority to ban flavored e-cigarettes. The governor is seeing if there is anything in current Ohio law where he can place a ban faster than a statutory change in the normal legislature. Michigan and New York have recently instituted bans and the Congress of the United States is considering the matter. There are hundreds and hundreds of people, mostly young men, that the Center for Disease Control has confirmed are suffering from vaping-related lung illnesses. At least eight people in six states are confirmed to have died from it. All the research involving e-cigarettes and vaping show that it is extremely dangerous to our health. Talks of banning flavored e-cigarette products have intensified in light of a multi-state outbreak of lung injuries associated with e-cigarette use. Last week, the Center for Disease Control announced the number of illnesses linked to vaping has risen to 530 and confirmed eight people have died from those ailments. According to a University of Michigan study published this past week in the New England Journal of Medicine, 25% of high school seniors vaped nicotine in the previous month. That is up to 21% the previous year. Also, teenage e-cigarette users are actually at a higher risk of smoking tobacco cigarettes compared to non-users. More than 30% of adolescent e-cigarette users start smoking traditional tobacco cigarettes within six months. And like regular tobacco smoke, vaping can cause secondhand effects. Although e-cigarettes do not produce smoke, breathing in secondhand vapor can be harmful. The aerosol from e-cigarettes contain harmful chemicals, including lead and other heavy metals. It also uses flavorings that have been linked to lung disease. Secondhand vapor can also include nicotine, which can be inhaled by non-users. Now, starting October 17th, the minimum age to purchase tobacco products in Ohio will be 21. This applies to vape pens also, so it's a start. Any laws in Ohio that greatly hinder the proliferation of vaping products should be welcomed by all of us. The health of us all, and particularly our young, is at stake. I'm just curious as to what our Brooklyn schools deal with and how they deal with the vaping. And if anyone knows, I'd be curious to know if they can add to that. Thank you. And that pretty much completes my report. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, the Public Safety and Environmental Committee will have a meeting follow, immediately following tonight's council meeting to discuss Ordinance 2019-38 that's on your agenda this evening. All are welcome to attend. Next is the Board of Zoning Appeals, Commissioner Colsar. Thank you, Mr. Van Kirk. The Board of Zoning Appeals met on September 19th and heard a request from Premier Brooklyn LLC. This is for the uh, Ruan uh, Trucking Company that when it was planning on going into the old J.D. Norman site. Uh, the board approved a variance to uh, use a pervious pavement system and this is uh, conditional pending approval by the city engineer and the planning commission through the uh, site plan approval process. The next scheduled meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals will be October 17th, 6 p.m. here in Brooklyn uh, City Hall conference room. That completes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Next up is our school board liaison, Councilman Ranchi. Thank you. The school board met on September 17th. Details of the state report card were given. Brooklyn schools got an overall letter grade of C, including two A's in progress and in the graduation rate. They did struggle with other scores and got a D in achievement, gap closing, improving at-risk K-3 to readers, and being prepared for success. 
finally, there will be a renewal levy on the ballot this November. This levy does not increase taxes, but is important for the schools to maintain their budget. And that ends my report. Thank you. Uh, the planning commission meeting, uh, the next planning commission meeting, excuse me, will take place on Thursday, October the 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Brooklyn City Hall Conference Room. You hear the following. A request from Rodney Hertz, Michelle Hertz, and Donald McMahon for a lot split consolidation at 7328 and 7332 Associate Avenue. A request from Adam Signs for internally illuminated wall signs for World's, World's Gym at 6700 Bidoff. A request from Air Commercial Interiors for internally illuminated wall signs for Height 2 Laundry at 6600 Bidoff. A request from SMJ for a wireless telecommunications facility company location for a Sprint at 8500 Clinton Road. A request from Skyline Chile Incorporated of Red Architecture for conditional use for a drive through in an, L, in an LI or light industrial district at 0 Tiedemann Road. And a request from Skyline Chile Incorporated for a preliminary <laughs> site approval for a Skyline Chile at 0 Tiedemann Road. And again, that meeting will take place on Thursday, October the 3rd at 6 p.m. Are welcome to attend. At this time, we'll have reports of council. We'll begin this evening with Mrs. Politsky. Thank you, Mr. Banker. Good evening. The last week of, of summer has passed, hot and humid for September. I hope you took the time to visit the Shunpike sale at the Brooklyn Historical Society. We had a delicious assortment of baked goods, jellies from Amish country, and an assortment of flavored vinegars. Crafts too numerous to describe were made by our dedicated volunteers. The quilt to be raffled off at the Fall Fest was also on display, but tickets are a dollar each in six for five dollars. You will still have the opportunity to purchase some at the Fall Fest. The Royal Garden Club will also have a table at the Fall Fest. This is an exciting time for the club. Consider becoming a member. Membership is only ten dollars a year. A grant request has been submitted to the National Garden Club. If awarded, we will use the funds to update the landscape at the Brooklyn Historical Society. A recreation trails program application from the city requests $120,000 with the city contributing $20,000 to create a trailhead behind the Brooklyn Historical Society, connecting it to Lower Veterans Memorial Park. I have lived in Brooklyn for many decades and belong to both organizations for several years. We jokingly say they are the best kept secrets in Brooklyn. I have. I met a resident a few weeks ago that inquired about the club and came to our September meeting. She had never heard of us until then. When she mentioned this to her father, a longtime resident, he said he has known about it for years. We need to get the word out. Please help us do that. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Ms. Blitzky. Next up is Mrs. Ranchuk. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who came out this past weekend to our community cleanup. We had to do a little bit of improvising as we were cleaning up Memorial Park and there was an event, a uh, bike event going on. But we were able to clean up parts of the lower park around the Senior Center and Police Station, along Memphis Avenue, and around the Rec Center. Our next and final cleanup this year will be held on Saturday, October 19th in partnership with Parma Councilman DePiro. We'll be meeting at 9 o'clock at the Home Depot, home, yeah, home Depot, and clean up both sides of Brook Park Road. You can stay after for pizza. Last week, I attended a Cleveland City Club event about the First Ring Suburbs. It was very informational with panelists from South Euclid, Warrensville Heights, Lakewood, and Shaker Heights. There was discussion about economic development, the loss of industrial jobs around Greater Cleveland, older and outdated housing stock and more. I look forward to reaching out to a couple of the panelists and bringing some of their successful projects and ideas to, to our home in Brooklyn in the future. And that ends my report. Thank you. Next up is Mr. Selvers. Thank you. Good evening. Tomorrow, Tuesday, September 24th is Bubba's Yard. It's the fresh produce distribution behind City Hall. Local income families are invited to stop by between 4 and 7 p.m. to pick up fruits and vegetables from the Cleveland Food Bank at no charge to them. The Economic Development Committee will meet this Wednesday, September 25th at 9 a.m. at the second floor uh, City Hall Conference Room. The agenda is the following, approval of the minutes from the July 1st, 2019 meeting, review or proposal received from Joseph Lieber for the purchase of certain real property 
located at 11050 Memphis Avenue, permanent parcel number 431-07-003. 3rd item on the agenda is review a proposal from Speedway LLC for the purchase of certain real property located at 8519 Memphis Avenue. Personal property number 432-21-014 through 432-21-018. There will be a public works committee meeting next Tuesday, October 1st, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be for continued discussions relating to the drainage issues in the Summer Lane and Kennedy area, uh, Kennedy Drive area there adjoining each other on the properties. Good luck to the Brooklyn High School Marching Band going this Saturday to the 2019 Buckeye Invitational at Ohio Stadium. It will be a long day for them, but it will also be worth it for the pride of performing there and the memories that they will create for themselves and their families. Coffee with a Cop is this coming Wednesday, October 2nd from 3 to, 5, 3 to 6 p.m. at Starbucks on Ridge Road. We'll give you a chance to meet your local officers, learn about the department, and talk about your community. And one of the teams that's doing very well at the schools, the girls soccer team will be home on Saturday, October 5th. Uh, please check for the school calendar for the exact time. It might be 10 or 11 a.m. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Next up is Mrs. Bucci. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to mention about uh, John Bundy's passing. And um, I knew John for, I think it was almost 40 years. I knew his parents. I know his whole family. Um, one thing I think most people who knew John would say is that he truly loved the city of Brooklyn and its residents. And he was also very proud of his service to our community, both as a firefighter and a paramedic, and then also uh, serving as one of our trustees on uh, the board of Parma Hospital. His, uh, John also donated a lot of his time and money to various charitable causes. His passing is a tremendous loss to his family and his friends. I attended his wake and funeral mass, which were both very well attended and crowded, which is a testament to how many lives John had touched. I'd like to thank Mr. McCann for, McGann for his informative presentation this evening. This is something that we all need to pay attention to. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Stopa for sharing his concerns and hopefully we'll be able to get some answers uh, for him. Um, I too attended the school board meeting and one of the other pieces of information that was shared was that in some of the areas where they were not able to reach the next level of ranking, they saw improvement, but the improvement was just not enough to reach that next uh, grade level. Um, they communicated that they are definitely not satisfied with uh, the current rankings. However, they are um, committed to keeping on the path of the improvements that they have been making. So hopefully um, we'll be able to see some of those jumps in those number rankings um, with the next uh, school report card. One of the examples they gave, and unfortunately I don't have my notes in front of me, my detailed notes, but one of the things they, examples they shared, which uh, was something that they're going to try and get more information about, and that is the fact that um, they were penalized by a tremendous amount by the fact that there were 15 special needs students who did not take some of the proficiency tests and because of that they lost a lot of ground in one particular area and that is something um, you know as they go through and analyze how they were ranked that was one of the things they mentioned that they needed a little bit more clarification on that because it had a tremendous impact on one of their rankings um, I want to talk a little bit tonight about um, the plastic bag ban issue um, first, the county ordinance and what it does. Beginning January 1st, the county ordinance would prohibit retail establishments from providing a disposable plastic bag with the following exceptions. A disposable bag that a customer brought with them, the newspaper bags, a bag for prescriptions, a bag used to package bulk items or such as the, um, the bags that you use to put fresh meat, poultry, uh, produce in, uh, baked goods or flowers, 
a bag from a restaurant for take out or leftovers, a dry cleaning or a yard waste bag, prepackaged bags that are used for pet waste, bags provided for transporting a partially consumed bottle of wine, which is permitted under the Ohio Revised Code, a bag provided for curbside pickup or delivery of food, and a bag to transport hazardous materials. The ordinance also requires retailers that do provide paper bags that they must provide paper bags that are manufactured from at least 40% recycled content and that the bag is 100% recyclable. What the proposed Brooklyn ordinance does, it establishes our own law that exempts retail establishments in our city from having to comply with the county law. It also establishes a new chapter in our codified ordinances titled Retail Disposable Bag Recycling. This applies to retail establishments 30,000 square feet or larger. These retail establishments can only offer disposable bags if they provide a collection bin for customers to deposit bags and it requires the retail establishment to ensure that all disposable plastic bags are collected, transported, and recycled and not deposited within a solid waste facility except if they are not sufficiently free of foreign material to enter the recycling stream. In other words, if they're contaminated, then they do not have to um, ensure that they're recycled. First, my thoughts on the county ordinance. We have a recycling crisis in this country to the point that the future of curbside recycling is now in jeopardy. For decades, China bought the bulk of the recycling, not just from the US, but about 70% of the world's plastic, 58% of the US plastic, 7 million tons a year. They made money from processing it and selling the resulting raw materials. For American recyclers, this was too good a deal to pass up. Many types of plastics, bags and cups among them, gum up the sorting machines at the materials recovery centers in the U.S. and most of it is of no value at all to U.S. recyclers. The West Coast ports were full of empty Chinese cargo containers that had been used to deliver goods to the U.S. So it made sense to send the waste in the empty ships that were returning to China anyway. China had plenty of capacity for the plastic and they also had cheap labor to sort the recyclable plastic from the plastics that were not recyclable. By 2016, the U.S. was exporting 700,000 tons a year to China. About five years ago, the Chinese government became concerned about all the trash because a lot of the plastic was contaminated, which made it either not recyclable or very difficult to recycle. This meant that it was no longer profitable. Additionally, a large quantity of plastic was sneaked in illegally by fly-by-night recyclers who dumped what they could not recycle, causing pollution on land and in waterways. One of the oldest recycling centers in the U.S. is part of the Ecology Center in California, and they were concerned about what they suspected could be happening to some of the plastic scrap they were recycling in China. In 2016, they buried a GPS transponder in one of the bales. They were able to follow the signal to a town in China and then contact local residents to document exactly what happened to it. Their worst fears were confirmed. The waste was dumped in a local canyon of materials that could not be recycled and plastic was incorporated into the soil of nearby cornfields. The Chinese government cracked down and in 2017, they reduced their plastic trash imports. Then in January of 2018, it enacted its national sword policy, which bans 24 types of solid waste, including various plastics and unsorted mixed papers, and sets a much tougher standard for contamination, 99.5% clean. This is a standard that U.S. recyclers just cannot meet. In 2018, China took in less than 1% of what it took in in 2016. Then the U.S. turned to other smaller Asian countries for our waste exports. However, those increased numbers dropped after those countries had to reduce what they imported. 
The sad thing is that much of the plastic imported by these smaller Asian countries can only be gotten rid of by burning it, which then impacts their air, water, and land. There are parts of the U.S. where recyclables are being stockpiled because they have nowhere to send them. There are cities that have had to curtail or eliminate curbside recycling. Clearly, it is not just disposable bags that are the cause of this problem, but they are definitely a contributing factor. <coughs> According to the EPA, over 38 billion plastic bags are used in the U.S. each year. According to the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. goes through 100 billion plastic shopping bags annually, and this costs our retailers $4 billion. Four out of five grocery bags used in the U.S. are now plastic. <coughs> the average American family takes home almost 1,500 plastic shopping bags a year. And according to waste management, only 1% of plastic bags are returned for recycling. That means that the average family only recycles 15 bags a year. The rest end up in landfills or as litter. Now, I am not a radical with extremist views, and I certainly reuse any bags we do get from retailers, and we recycle everything we can. But the fact is, we have a crisis with plastic, and it is harmful to our environment and our health. Since plastic is made mostly from petroleum, it does not degrade, and that plastic ends up in landfills and in our waterways, creating microplastics that end up in our food chain. There are many countries, states, and cities that already have bans in place or have enacted bans that will be going into effect over the next few years. I think it's clear that as citizens, we need to reduce our over-reliance on single-use plastics, and I think it's inevitable that these regulations will become the norm in the near future. Is the county ban going to solve the national problem we have with plastic? Of course not but it is one very small step in the right direction. This topic reminds me of when the city of Brooklyn was the first in Northeast Ohio and only the second in the entire state of Ohio to adopt legislation for mandatory curbside recycling. For those of you who were not around then, do you think that it was not a revolutionary idea at the time that residents were not skeptical and upset about having to change the way they disposed of their garbage? that they were not opposed to having to rinse out their cans, jars, and bottles. Of course, it was something new that we had to educate our residents about and why this change was important. We did not hide our heads in the sand. City leaders recognized the serious problems of trash disposal and how advantageous it was to extend the life of our landfill. This is now the norm and second nature to all of us. We all want to feel good when we believe that by recycling, we're keeping um, things out of the waste stream and helping the environment. I will share the rest of the information I gathered at the committee meeting, including my conversations with the managers of our retail stores in Brooklyn and why the collection receptacles in the stores are only a feel-good effort for consumers because at this point in time, because of a lack of end users for this plastic, the vast majority of these bags end up in landfills, not actually being recycled. I hope we've made provisions to tape the meeting so residents have the opportunity to hear this important discussion. As a point of information, there is proposed legislation at the state level, House Bill 242, that would prohibit counties and cities from enacting plastic bag bans and it would also prohibit retailers from charging for the plastic bags. To be clear, I'm opposed to this because it is yet another in a long line of bills that the state of Ohio has adopted that usurps home rule, which is provided for in our state constitution. Finally, what I believe is the most important point to the proposed Brooklyn Ordinance. I already mentioned this at the very first committee meeting where this was discussed. The level of government that is most responsive to local residents' day-to-day -day issues is local government, their city. I believe the second most responsive is the county, not necessarily by engaging directly with our residents, but rather through collaboration and as a funding source or funding conduit for local governments. 
We certainly collaborate with and receive funding either directly from the county or through the county. Just a couple of examples are the tree canopy grant that we were awarded that was just announced tonight. CDBG grants and CDBG supplemental grants. This year we were able to provide home maintenance grants to our residents because of such a grant. They have funded our master plan, the current update to our master plan. There is no other city in the county that has proposed enacting legislation at the local level to opt out their retailers from the plastic bag ban. Some cities may believe that House Bill 242 will be enacted so the county ban may not go into effect. However, we cannot be so naive not to recognize that by being the only city to oppose this county law, this will not, that this will not result in jeopardizing future funding and important collaborations with the county. At the end of the day, I'm here to make decisions on what I think is in the best interest of our residents in the city of Brooklyn. And if we are going to take a stand against county legislation, therefore jeopardizing important sources of funding for our community, it would have to be something extremely important to our community, not just my personal disagreement or personal dislike of their ordinance. To be clear, I would not hesitate taking this stand on an issue that I believed was critical to our city and our residents. But for me to put the city in this position, it would have to be such an issue. And in my opinion, the plastic bag ban does not rise to that level, especially because in all probability, the state interference will most likely result in the plastic bag ban either not going into effect or possibly going into effect briefly and then being prohibited. And that completes my report. Thank you. This is Bob here. Thank you. I too would like to um, extend my condolences to the Bundy family. I do remember Mr. Bundy was just a kind and gentle soul. And I do remember he was so religious. And that's one thing I do like about him. And um, also, I would like to thank all those volunteers at the Senior Center. I did get a chance to go over there to the Senior Center and go to that garage sale. And it, since I went back to work, I don't see my favorite seniors there, but there was a lot of hugging and kissing going on there. And I did um, happen to purchase some of the things over there. And since it was a garage sale, I was able to negotiate. And I did negotiate some Hummels and they were some beautiful items I did purchase. And it was just a lovely afternoon. And Tony DeMarco, our former um, council person, did make a surprise visit. So it was a lovely afternoon. And lastly, I would like to thank Kathy Pucci for that educated, um, um, little speech you had. Thank you, thank you, and more thank yous. I think, uh, you know, you did a great job on that. You're investigating reporter there. Thank you so much. And that pretty much completes my report. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I would like to offer my sincerest condolences to the family of John Bundy, who passed away recently. John was a dear friend and a longtime resident in the city of Brooklyn. He will be deeply missed. Councilwoman Mary Balbeer brought up on the vaping about what are the Brooklyn City Schools doing. I get the hurricane watch, and I believe all the parents do, and they're taking it very, very seriously. Mr. Wingler sends me out an email <coughs> on everything that's going on, in the, in the um, principal, Mr. Wingler, sending out an email to me every week what's going on in the schools and at the end of that email is always reiterating what he's saying about vaping. Vaping has become a serious issue in all high schools across America. There has been a rash of vaping related illnesses and a death recently. If you are found vaping or possessing a vape, the following discipline will occur. First offense is an automatic five day suspension Second offense is an automatic 10-day suspension. Third offense is expulsion. We are putting vape detectors in all restrooms. So I believe what he told me that these detectors are going to be hooked up to some kind of app to, to their phones. So when it, something does go on in one of the bathrooms, they'll be alerted immediately and they'll be able to respond to it. So I believe with that language he puts out every week to the residents, I believe that uh, 
Um, it should cut down and or eliminate what's going on in those schools, I'm hoping. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Chancey. A couple things. First, I want to thank uh, Dalen, Adam, Tyler, and Victoria, all four of our uh, Brooklyn uh, students that emailed me this week with regards to different things that are going on in the city, asking some questions, and so I look forward to uh, speaking with them further. One of them is supposed to be actually at our next council meeting, so I appreciate the school kids uh, being involved in their city government. It says a lot when they do that. Um, as far as um, Mrs. Pucci's comments regarding the uh, plastic bag ban, I'm certainly not going to go through and uh, unpack everything that she said. I have a rather lengthy report to discuss in our uh, commission meeting, so I will, our committee meeting, so I will just uh, go over the highlights. Um, I have several um, regards to this, and this, this legislation was introduced by myself as well as Councilwoman um, Ryan Shockey, and we'll talk more about that in the committee meeting. But my two main objectives, first of all, is home rule. Um, home rule is vital for the sustainability of our local government. Uh, home rule continues to be under attack both at the state level and at the county level. Home rule allows the citizens of Brooklyn to have a direct say on ordinances that are introduced, discussed, and passed in our city. Home rule allows Brooklyn to legislate Brooklyn. This county ordinance does the exact opposite of that. It shelves Brooklyn in a box with every other city in the county. The needs of the city of Brooklyn are vary dramatically from the other cities in our county. Passing this legislation at the county level is in clear violation of the Home Rule Statute. If the residents of Brooklyn feel that such a ban is best for Brooklyn, then officials elected in Brooklyn by Brooklyn residents can introduce, discuss, and potentially pass such legislation. I have, I have heard several county council members complain about how the state violates their Home Rule, and they're accurate in saying that, <clears throat> with some of the legislation which, to which I agree again. However, the county is now doing the exact same thing with this legislation. It was actually brought up by one of the county council people at their meeting when they voted on this. At the state level, as Mrs. Pucci mentioned, the state is attempting to outlaw legislation such as what the county has passed. I am against that legislation. I am not in favor of the state coming forward and violating the county's home rule as well as cities. If cities feel that these bans are best for their community, then by all means, introduce the legislation in those individual cities. Number two problem I have is communication. To the best of my knowledge, at no point in the county's discussion of this ordinance were any members of this county contacted by or this council, contacted by email, phone, asked about our thoughts on how this would impact our city. The mayor, to my knowledge, never received a single communication regarding the impact of it either. There were no community meetings held in Brooklyn for Brooklyn residents to voice their concerns. In my opinion, this is a huge problem. The county council exists solely to represent the interests of the county and her cities. How can that be accomplished if cities are not even contacted regarding such sweeping legislation as this? In the least, the county should have reached out to every single administration and council in this county seeking their input on the impact of such legislation. This did not happen with this legislation. In the eight years that I've been on, almost eight years that I've been on council, this has not happened with any prior county legislation to my knowledge. In fact, not one time has any county council member contacted me regarding the effect that any potential county legislation would have on Brooklyn. Also, to the best of my recollection, no county, no county council members ever contacted me about anything Brooklyn related. Well, now that this Brooklyn ordinance has been introduced, that has changed. I was contacted by a county council member earlier this, or this last week, imploring me to go along with the county ordinance. While I appreciate their thoughts on the fact, this is too little too late. Number three, this ban is not a ban. There are 11 exemptions to this legislation. Mrs. Pucci read all the exemptions to this. And a cursory look at this legislation will show this is not a ban at all. This is the county council saying that some bags are bad if they're at one store, but those identical bags can be used at another store across the street at a restaurant and be perfectly fine. Then some of those same bags are now not bad at all because of what's going into them. Not only does that not make sense, it's the government picking winners and losers, and that's exactly what this legislation does. Number four. This legislation will cost residents and businesses more money. If these bags are banned, residents will be forced to purchase alternatives. The alternatives to many of these, as they call them single-use bags, are the plastic bags you get at Walmart. Very few of them are single-use. Mrs. Pucci mentioned that only 1% of them are recycled. That's because the vast majority of them are used, again, for waste liners to pick up uh, pet waste, so on and so forth. It, if those bags are then outlawed, people will then have to purchase alternatives. While this expense may not be profound to some, it will negatively affect those who can least afford it, as does most legislation like this. Brooklyn is not a wealthy community. Many residents here live on a fixed income, and any increase, no matter how small, will make their lives more difficult. This ban does just that. Despite the fact the county is purchasing a very limited number of bag alternatives, I doubt they're gonna be able to disperse 1.3 million, approximate number of people that live in Cuyahoga County. 
And number five, Mrs. Pucci talked about plastic. Um, I have three pages um, talking about plastic. I'm not gonna bore you with those details tonight. We will talk about them in the committee meeting. Um, as far as the stores that in Brooklyn that do that, that um, she discussed, I too spoke with many of them. Um, the fact that, that to say that, that most of it is just a feel good ordinance, I would argue that this ordinance is just a feel good ordinance for the county and does very, very little uh, to solve any type of problem that we have in this, in this area. Um, in fact, Mrs. Pucci mentioned that there's no one that will, or to the best of her knowledge, there's no one that will recycle these plastic bags. That's simply not true. There are those. As far as the national sort with China, she is correct that China has stopped taking our uh, plastic bags, and we currently don't have a solution for that. That's because we haven't had to. China has taken care of it for many, many years. Now that has changed, the, the free market system will, there will be companies that, that come about this that will take over this. The free market system will take over. And again, I'll save the rest of my comments for this. Uh, for the committee meeting, uh, but the bottom line is is that this is a violation of home rule. As far as being the only city that does this, I can tell you right now we are not the only city that's considering this. I personally have talked to two other cities that are considering this. A third one has emailed our clerk of council requesting our legislation. Many of them, as Mrs. Pucci mentioned, are waiting for the state to take action. To me, that's inexcusable for a city government. That's not the city's job to do that. It's home rule that should be taking care of this, not the state. And so I have no problem personally being the only city if this is what I feel is best for the residents of Brooklyn, uh, for the residents of this city to do. And so we'll talk more about this uh, whenever we get to uh, the safety committee meeting. But obviously this is something uh, new to this area. Um, I still have, have not heard exactly how the county is gonna go about dispersing these bags or how they're even gonna inform um, businesses of this, right? But we'll talk more about that in the safety committee meeting. At this time, I'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Mr. Van Kirk. Uh, I'm just gonna go through some events first. I'll talk about a couple other things. I just wanna remind everyone, Fall Festival is this Saturday from noon to five. It's always a great event. If you have little kids or grandchildren, hay rides, food trucks, uh, different options, uh, tons of games for the kids, so come on out. Um, hopefully the rain stays away. It looks like it's 40% chance rain right now, uh, but that is Cleveland, so that changes every day. Um, on October 4th at 9 a.m. I will have a coffee with the mayor at the Senior Center. If you have time, if you have any questions for me, come on out. Um, on October 7th at 6 o'clock, we ha will have a budget meeting with City Council on Capital Items. This is uh, open to all. On October 10th, we have a Meet the Candidates Night hosted by the Chamber at noon in the Senior Center. And then uh, I just want to remind everybody that the next council meeting will be on October 15th. It's moved back a day because of Columbus Day. Uh, this past weekend, I had a chance to go to the Shumpike sale for the Historical Society where they paid the city rent. Um, every year we get a, a basket of apples and a couple dollars to pay rent for the Historical Society using the city building. Um, always a good sale and I appreciate all the volunteers who do so much to make Brooklynites remember all the great memories we had from the times and, and we get to look back at the old pictures of the way things used to look with um, horse farms and airports um, and you can see what's there now so um, very cool and I appreciate all of their hard work to uh, maintain those memories. Um, I mentioned this in the finance meeting, but uh, I want to thank Mike Foley. I am the chair for the Mayors and Managers Regionalism Committee, so anytime I have thoughts on ideas where uh, the county can be of assistance to communities, I pass them on. One of those things is, it actually got brought up by Mrs. Pucci, is uh, recycling. If you saw the news uh, a few months back, they did a uh, story about Cleveland and the recycling and how a ton of their recycling is going into the trash. Uh, just with the costs going up and, and we having uh, this area having to keep it local and not sending it to China. Um, our service director checked to make sure that ours is not being put in the trash and it's not, it's going to a separate. So I'm thankful for that. But I do worry about the costs. At one point we used to receive reimbursement for recycling. Um, that no longer happens and so uh, our contract is set right now but as that contract comes up with the City of Cleveland, uh, as their costs go up, of course they're going to pass that cost on to us. So I think we should be a little bit more proactive as a county to find alternate choices. I hope Mr. Baker is right and the free market takes control, but if it doesn't, um, that's where the government has to play a role. So um, they're going to have a recycle roundtable with the mayors, the solid waste, and Department of Sustainability for the county. 
Um, I also want to thank the county for coming out last Friday. Uh, we did a tour, economic development tour, uh, all the ED department for the county um, came around um, and we stopped at a few businesses here in Brooklyn. We stopped at the One American Way site. Uh, I think uh, this was a really good opportunity for county officials who have not been out here to see all the stuff going on in Brooklyn. A lot of people have this uh, um, this viewpoint of Brooklyn being in a four and a half square mile, 11,000 residents, that we don't have a lot of economic development or businesses here, especially um, the economic development director for the county is an out-of-towner originally. So for him to come in and see all the things happening in Brooklyn, uh, he was amazed. So I think that uh, him understanding our community, the opportunities we have here, and also making clear about Brooklyn's needs going forward as far as infrastructure and other things uh, is vitally important. So um, I hope to keep us on the radar. Um, I don't believe that whatever happens with the plastic ban uh, would jeopardize the relationship we have the, with the county internally. Um, I, I speak with all the directors all the time on different issues. Uh, that is just my viewpoint. I've talked to uh, Mike Foley about this uh, during <coughs> sustainability. And we do have a really good relationship with the county. And there are points and times where you can you can agree to disagree on things or you may not be perfect lockstep in everything and that doesn't mean that um, you shouldn't be el eligible for grants if you have the best application or um, any of the such or not providing businesses in that community services so um, I know we're all bigger than that so I that is not a concern for me and then the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about, actually two more things. Uh, today we actually had a representative come from West Virginia to the Norfolk Southern Bridge at Lindale in Brooklyn. Um, as you can see, that bridge is a terrible presence coming into the city of Brooklyn. Um, and we've been trying to work on it internally, doing something uh, for years, frankly. And so the fact that we got their government rep to come in from West Virginia today to take a look at it, and we're having a serious conversation about applying for a federal grant together in partnership with Brooklyn taking the lead, uh, them doing the structural repairs that are needed, um, Brooklyn looking at the aesthetic repairs along with Lindale, who's uh, welcome to the partnership. And uh, we hope that goes somewhere. That grant would be due at the end of October, so there's a very short deadline. Uh, but we're going to continue to have that conversation. We already have a conference call set up for that next week with some state uh, reps here. And then the last thing, Andy Sellers brought up the economic development agenda and the, the possible purchase of the Speedway property. We are actually looking at a grant. It's called the State um, Gas Station Cleanup. That property, although the, the gas tanks are removed, the soil is contaminated. Uh, so we have that possibility of um, seeking that grant for remediation. Uh, so it's one of the things we'll be talking about. Uh, Speedway is, is one of my big pet peeves going by it every day. It's, I, I feel like um, it's slow and polite. Uh, that whole area has needed repair for a long time. And we finally have um, somebody from their corporate office that gave us a price on what they'd be willing to sell it for. And I think it's a really good opportunity for Brooklyn if we can get the funding to uh, remove that property. Uh, as well as West Creek Conservancy and McCulley Group, our communications, uh, have been looking at a Ohio cleanup grant for the up to bat property. Uh, I don't know if that's going to go anywhere, but um, that whole corridor could just be uh, uh, improved by removing those properties. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mayor. We'll now move on to director's reports. We begin this evening with our finance director, Mr. Rubin. <coughs> Thank you. Good evening. I do have a couple items I want to address with City Council tonight. Um, as part of the, my report last week, I included the August financial report. Uh, just a brief summary of the report as far as the general fund is concerned. Overall revenues are at 83% of the estimated amount and are 17% higher than we were at August of 2018. Uh, the substantial reasoning for this is due to one-time revenue sources as it relates to our income tax revenue and our permit revenue as far as large construction projects are concerned that we that have happened or are currently happening this year and as, and as well as additional interest uh, revenue we've received as compared to last year. 
as far as the general fund commitments are concerned, we're at 70% of the budget amount, which is fairly consistent with, um, with last year. So overall, that puts us at a surplus, a fiscal year surplus of $1.94 million through August. Um, that comes to an ending unencumbered balance of $18 million in the general fund. And a couple other items uh, to report. So as I mentioned at the Finance Committee meeting earlier this evening, uh, we've updated our financial transparency site um, to include 2018 financial information as it relates to our CAFR, since our CAFR has been audited and released to the public. So I encourage uh, everyone to go out to our website, brooklynohio.gov, and uh, click on the financial transparency site on the main page. It's a, I think it's a drastic improvement from the initial one done earlier this year, which was good, but this is this is an improvement over that. And lastly, um, as a follow-up to my report on September 9th, um, we are running a non-filer program with the Regional Income Tax Agency as far as um, sending out reminders to potential taxpayers who have not filed with the City of Brooklyn. Um, so the, the non-filer letters went out last Thursday. Approximately 2,900 letters were mailed out. So if you receive anything from the Regional Income Tax Agency, it may be that. So I would encourage you to open it and not throw it away and to go forward with the process. Uh, that concludes my report tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. And lastly is our voting commissioner, Mr. Colson. Thank you. I just want to give a little update. We had quite uh, quite the summer construction-wise. Uh, tap packaging uh, went in at the Hugo Boss uh, facility there. The Keystone was the last uh, uh, suit business that was in there. They uh, did a lot of work for their facility. Um, and uh, that came out good, a great addition to the city. Also, the rear portion of that building, they didn't use the whole thing, uh, is right now being remodeled for XPO Logistics, uh, which is also uh, in the city already. So, um, Raising Canes is, the, is uh, the new chicken fingers joint that's gonna be going in uh, at the old Perkins. They plan on being open by the holidays. It's moving along swiftly. And uh, so is the Fairfield Inn, uh, which is going in behind Cracker Barrel. They're uh, dried in now, and they should be open uh, sometime in the spring. Ross Dress for Less, a uh, big project that uh, is going in the long vacant grocery store uh, that was uh, in Ridge Park Square. And then uh, we have been getting questions about the laundry in Bidoff Plaza, and as far as we know, that is still going to be going in there. Uh, on property maintenance uh, front, um, I want to thank Don for, for his, uh, his insight on, the, on his feelings of the property maintenance in his area. And it just so happens that our street walks are going through the area right now. We've done Don Cliff, Apple Creek, Pepper Ridge, and uh, uh, currently going through uh, Springcrest, Ivy Wood, and Rabbit Run. Uh, this uh, property inspection, property maintenance inspection program, where we basically do uh, street walk, walk down the sidewalks, and uh, cite cite any uh, violations there are to our property maintenance code. And then uh, also this time of year, with uh, candidates out walking, they uh, have, are able to evoke a lot of complaints from residents as they stop by and visit. So that's something that. Uh, we're constantly picking up on and following up on. And then, uh, as always, I encourage you know, any resident who has any, any problem with, uh, with the property maintenance issue, neighbor, or whatever it might be, just to give us a call. And we will look into it. That completes my report. Thank you, Mr. Colson. We're now moving on with our legislation for this evening. Uh, first thing, uh, the two notifications I already mentioned, the first of which is a grant award from the Cuyahoga County 2019 Healthy Urban, Urban Tree Grant Program. I have a letter from Mr. Verber. The City of Brooklyn was awarded a grant from the Cuyahoga County 2019 Healthy Urban Tree Canopy Grant Program for $41,535. The City has identified a number of areas needing significant investment in tree coverage in the urban canopy. The areas that will be covered with the grant include Brooklyn Memorial Park, Bidoff and Southwood, Ridge Road, Knight Commons, and several trees will be placed on the side streets. The city will purchase 250 trees to be planted during the upcoming fall of 2019 and the spring of 2020. Along with the trees, we will also purchase some supplies and safety equipment, and that comes from our service director, Mr. Verba. The next notification is a donation of $1,000. Dear Mayor Gallagher, please accept this donation from the Laurel Garden Club in the amount of $1,000 towards the purchase of an irrigation system 
that will supply water to the blue and gold star memorials in the wooden stars and veterans memorial park the laurel garden club has been in existence in brooklyn ohio since november 10 1953 it has been active in and contributed to various projects throughout its existence on behalf of the Laurel Garden Club, uh, Barbara Politsky, President. And so I want to thank you, Mrs. Politsky and the Laurel Garden Club for that uh, very kind donation. It would be nice to get the irrigation in there. So thank you for that and all the work you do in our city. Welcome. We do have a request this evening uh, for a uh, liquor permit. Any comments or questions on that? Are you going to read it? Or? Yep. It's to uh, it's it's uh, to tra it's a transfer from IYS Ventures LLC uh, to 7-Eleven Incorporated, both the same address, 10300 Park Park Road. I'm assuming this is just a change of uh, company. This is a different company that's moving in. Move for a position of no objection. Second. For a position of no objection. <coughs> Bart Politsky. Yes. Ron Van Kirk. Abstain. Meg Ryan Shackey. Yes. Andy Selberts? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvier? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. As per council rules, anytime a council member abstains, they have to see the reason why. And uh, alcohol, uh, dealing issues with alcohol goes against my faith, and so I abstain from such uh, requests. Under legislation this evening is resolution 2019 4. This is on second reading, but we hope to pass by uh, suspension of the rules. Accepting the amounts and rates as determined by the Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county fiscal officer. Are there any comments or questions? Here to suspend the rules. <laughs> to suspend the rules, Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shackey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvier? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. To adopt, Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shackey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvier? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. Next is resolution 2019-5. Again, on second reading, we hope to pass by suspension of the rules, requesting the county fiscal officer to advance taxes from the proceeds of the 2019 tax levies pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, section 321-34. Any comments or questions? Okay. Are you ready to suspend the rules? Second. To suspend the rules, Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shackey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvier? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. To adopt, Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shackey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvier? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. On second reading this evening is Ordinance 2019-36, accepting funds from Meridian Senior Living LLC of Brooklyn Point LLC for sponsorship of the City of Brooklyn Senior Services bus. Next up is Ordinance 2019-38 on second reading, exempting retailers within the City of Brooklyn from Ordinance Number O 2019-005, adopted by the Cuyahoga County Council on May the 28, 2019, which creates a countywide disposable bag ban and creating Chapter 759 of the Brooklyn Codified Ordinances, retail disposable bag recycling, to require the collection and recycling of disposable bags at certain retail establishments in the city. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items uh, in this um, ordinance. I uh, propose that we amend this. Uh, two changes. One um, is 2019-38 uh, number one in proposed uh, BCO section 759.01A. Add the word square between 30,000 and feet, so it will read 30,000 square feet. Number two, I move to amend section seven of the ordinance to read, quote, that this ordinance shall take effect and be in force on January 1st, 2020. Otherwise, it shall take effect and be in force from and after the earliest period allowed by law. Uh, the square feet was just missing in the original legislation. And then there was nothing put in as to when the um, recycle bins located at the stores would have to be in place. And so I'm um, conferring with uh, uh, Ms. Ryan Shockey, who um, introduced this with me, we decided that January 1st, 2020 would be the best day for that since that's when the county ordinance was set to go in place anyways. So I'll make a motion that we place on second reading as amended. Second. To amend on second reading, Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kerr? Yes. Meg Ryan Shockey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? No. Mary Bell Beer? No. Kevin Tansky? Yes. It is amended on second reading. Under new business this evening, resolution 2019-6 is on first reading, but we hope to uh, pass by suspension of the rules. A resolution to recognize October 20 to 26, 2019 as Stormwater Awareness Week in the city of Brooklyn, Ohio. Any comments or questions? There it is, we'll suspend the rules. Second. 
To suspend the rules. Barb Polinsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shockey? Yes. Andy Selhertz? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvere? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. To adopt. Barb Polinsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shockey? Yes. Andy Selhertz? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvere? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. And lastly, on first reading, I hope to pass by suspension this evening is Ordinance 2019-39. Amending Section 2 of Ordinance 2018-25 as previously amended titled, Establishing Petty Cash Funds for Various Departments in the City of Brooklyn. Are there any comments or questions? Okay. Can I'll suspend the rules? Second. To suspend the rules, Bart Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shockey? Yes. Andy Selhertz? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvere? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. To adopt? Bart Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shockey? Yes. Andy Selhurst? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Del Beer? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. That concludes our agenda for this evening. In a moment, I'm going to make a motion that we move into executive session for a discussion of a potential purchase of property. The executive session will be no longer than five minutes. Uh, following the executive session, we'll adjourn the council meeting, and then we will immediately begin the Public Safety and Environmental Committee meeting. So at this time, I'll make a motion that council adjourn to executive session. In the executive session, I'd like to invite council, our law director, and our finance director. Second. For the purposes of discussing the purchase of public property. To adjourn to executive session. Barb Politsky? Yes. Ron Van Kirk? Yes. Meg Ryan Shackey? Yes. Andy Selberts? Yes. Kathy Pucci? Yes. Mary Belvere? Yes. Kevin Tansky? Yes. Just for reference, if you're not staying for the committee meeting, no further action will be taken in the council meeting once we come back. <laughs>